Good evening, guys. I hope that you all must be doing great and welcome back to your channel, Ansarkari. So let's start with our today's discussion from the Hindu newspaper for 2nd of December. So firstly, a small development we, which you should know is that under the POXO Act, that is the Protection of Children from the Sexual Offences Act, to protect the interest of a minor, the person or the child, he or she cannot be repeatedly called to testify in the court. So this is one of the rights conferred under this act to a minor. Then we keep on talking about the Uniform Civil Code, which is mentioned uh, under the Article 44 of the Constitution that falls under Part 4 of the DPSP, that is the Directive Principles of State Policy. And currently, the state of Goa has a Uniform Civil Code, which is functioning in that particular state, moving ahead. So we'll take up the discussion which focuses upon reviving the population of fresh water turtles in India. So the challenges that they face uh, are the illegal trade, then the demand for pets and for meat. And also we need to ensure that they are rehabilitated so as to sustain a sufficient amount of population of the freshwater turtles. And obviously, there are anti-trafficking operations to protect and to protect the population. So in India, we have two species of freshwater turtles. So the first one is the red crowned roofed turtle. You can see that in the picture. And the second one is the let's shock cell uh, turtle. And they are mentioned in the appendix one of the sites. So not mentioned. However, India has raised that. In the current COP, that is COP27, which was recently held in Egypt. So India raised the demand to include these species in Appendix 1 of the CITES Convention, that is Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And basically, CITES, uh, the objective is that an international treaty which ensures that trade in the wild animals and the plants do not threaten their survival. So you need to read it carefully. This can be twisted in the prelims examination that it is talking about, it is basically not talking about banning the trade in such species. However, it says that the trade that is happening is not a threat to their survival. So trade is not being prohibited under this convention. Then there are several steps and there are NGOs working in this direction. So one of them is the Turtle Survival Alliance India. Find out more about this. And talking about the population, so their habitat includes around the Chambal region, which is concentrated around Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and UP. So there is a one more NGO that is called Traffic. So I guess this has already been asked in the prelims examination. So what is Traffic? So it's an NGO which works on the issue of trade of wild animals and plants. And... India is reported to be one of the world's major sources and consumers of turtles and tortoises. So you must be knowing about the difference between a turtle and a tortoise. So the main difference is that the turtles, they are primarily aquatic, whereas tortoises are uh, terrestrial, so they spend more time on land. And talking about the species that are found in India, so there are around 29 species of freshwater turtles, which stands at 24, and tortoise, you have five species. So India has definitely, India is a biodiverse country, and moving ahead, so talking about the anti-trafficking operations, so as I just told you that the population of such turtles is found in the Chambal region. So to be specific, they are found in the National Chambal Gharyar Wildlife Sanctuary that spreads across three states of Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh. So this is for the red crowned roofed turtle. And the species recently made it to the list of the 25 most threatened freshwater turtles in the world along with the northern river terrapin which is left only in the sundarbans that is in west bengal and turtles they are primarily they are smuggled for three reasons as we just talked in the beginning what are the three challenges so the motives also remain the same so the first one is uh, they are threatened because of their meat so that is the first reason why people or these smugglers are interested in smuggling for their meat. This uh, trade, basically, it happens within the country. Second is 
as pets so within and outside india and third is to extract their calipi so calipi is it is a lower shell of the turtles which is used in manufacturing or making the chinese medicine so that is why the calipi is demanded and it, the turtles they are poached and they are trafficked so these are the three challenges that are there then we have forest departments and the wildlife crime control bureau they are working in cooperation and they are keeping the illegal trade in check so they are taking actions and initiatives so the wildlife crime control bureau is a statutory body with the mandate to prevent wildlife trafficking trafficking in the country and so uh, now this operation that is operation save kurma this can definitely come in prelims so you should know that it relates to preventing poaching transportation and illegal trade of live turtles and tortoises then we have operation uh, turtle tort shield 1 and operation tort shield 2 again that is in the same direction and they were taken up to tackle the illegal trade of live turtles then we have the indian star tortoise this is also one of the species and it has recently been upgraded to appendix 1 of the sites in uh, 2017 and west bengal it remains the hot spot for the illegal trade of turtles for meat and experts say that harvesting turtles for meat is also common in the states of tripura and assam so west bengal is the hot spot then uh, as we talked about the turtle survival alliance so uh, however much information is not been given so you can find out more about this then talking about the iucn status of the red crown roof turtle so it is critically endangered and the same goes for the northern river terrapin then uh, as we said that we require a collaborative approach between different law enforcement agencies who can contribute in this effort and also from the pt perspective you should know that the hajong tortoise lake it is located in the state of assam and it has been declared as a biodiversity heritage site and it is situated in the latang mapu reserved forest so that is there in the state of assam so a lot of facts and information regarding turtles both for pt and mates so you can go through it once again on your own and talking about another information that regards that is related to the online gambling so it has been seen that in the state of tamil nadu 25 lives have been lost because of death trap due to online rummy so we can say that in the garb of online games people are making such apps and games which are promoting online rummy and people are falling into that trap in the you know because they just want to get rich with a shortcut they want to be successful in life with a shortcut however things backfire and they end up ending their lives so a bill is coming up in the state of tamil nadu to ban the online gaming online gambling immediately and terming the online gambling a social hazard the madras high court has said that the state governments they had the right to pass a law to curb it so on similar lines a law has been formulated in tamil nadu and let's see whether it will be assented by the governor or not and do we require such a bill at the national level or not or not is also to be seen before these things become widespread all over india then uh, we'll be talking about the border dispute or not actually a dispute but a cause of concern between the border of india and myanmar so the border with myanmar it still remains sealed because it was the reason behind sealing it was that uh, during the covid-19 pandemic it was sealed uh, on march 10th 2021 and obviously to check the unrestricted influx of people inside india to you know curb the spread of covid-19 and an incident which happened on july 5th that that was about that the tamil traders they from the more district they had gone to myanmar to celebrate uh, the friends friends birthday and they were gunned down so they were killed there and this has obviously led to fear amongst the people and 
also Indian traders, they are not venturing into Myanmar after this incident. So because of this, obviously, uh, things they have become costlier in and around the areas. And you can see that the Kaba, Kaba Valley, which is located in Myanmar, so it is close to India. So you should be knowing that Kaba Valley is located in Myanmar from the PT perspective. Moving ahead, what are the global factors which are likely to enhance our tourist exchange programs between Kerala and Russia? So this is, we can say, uh, an opportunity for India, for Kerala to attract more of tourists from Russia. Firstly, because uh, these tourists, they were more, you can say, attracted towards Sri Lanka. So because of the economic crisis and the economic situation there, they are not going for tourism there and obviously because of the russia ukraine war also the 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 russians they are visiting to visiting to less number of european countries so india has a golden opportunity when it comes to wellness tourism so this sector can be promoted by the state of kerala and obviously a golden opportunity for us and also russia has recently listed india as one of their top five friendly countries for promoting travel and trade engagements so this is the update as far as tourism sector and russia is concerned moving ahead we've already talked much about should we require reforms in the collegium system or again we should take up the njac thing or not so this uh, this discussion has already been done and this particular article is talking on similar lines so we'll be keeping it for the next time okay so looking at the economic situation in india the signals they are they are mixed signals something some indicators some indexes they are showing a bad performance some are showing that we are performing really nicely when we compare it with other countries so today we'll be looking at certain other indicators also to get a more clear picture about the economic situation, the economic activity that is happening and expand, expanding in India. So we see that uh, despite inflation, the credit conditions, they must remain supportive of the real economy. So inflation is definitely one of the factors which is pulling us down, which is pulling us back. And because of that, we are indulged uh, in increasing the repo rates. That is a contractionary monetary policy. And the same goes for the U.S. economy. So uh, this article, it says that we recently, we like yesterday only, we talked about that the growth rate in the core sector was recorded at 0.1% for the second quarter of this fiscal. And that was majorly because of the manufacturing and the mining sector. But now we also see that there is slowdown in the private consumption expenditure and the government spending. So our economy's expansion is deaccelerated. It is being dragged down. And looking at the global slowdown, that is one of the factors because our demand for exports is not expanding because of the global slowdown. And that is obviously because of the COVID-19, the economies are recovering out of it. Then we have the geopolitical factors because of the Russia-Ukraine war. And obviously the oil prices are shooting up so the second one again i just said that it is because of the russia ukraine war and then we have the persistently high domestic inflation also so these are certain factors because of which inflation is at a higher level and talking about the expenditure front growth in both the bulwark that is private consumption spending and the government spending it has slowed down appreciably so not a positive thing for our economic performance and growth in future. Then sequentially, private consumption has signaled some festival-led rebound. So that is seasonal and short-term. Then we have growth in the gross fixed capital formation. It pointed to a growing willingness, willingness to invest on the part of the private businesses. So uh, as far as the investment scenario is concerned, the investment prospects are concerned, the private investors, they have a positive future picture and they are willing to invest in India. So that we can say a, a kind of safeguard for our economy. And moving ahead, uh, we also see that there are challenges when we talk about the data variability, volatility, and revisions. Basically, there is time lag when certain steps are taken and the time when we actually see things changing and the results on the ground. So because of that also, this is one of the challenges for the policymakers. And 
uh, as we just talked about that the growth in the eight uh, core uh, industries that has also slowed down as we saw it yesterday. So taking up this next piece of uh, article that is about, it basically connects safer roads with sustainable environment. So you can get a new idea, a new perspective when we are talking about sustainable environment. And you can definitely cite this as a point in your main answer. So this is talking about that if we ensure a higher amount of high or a higher road safety, we'll be able to uh, not basically, uh, you know, control much of reduction in the greenhouse gases, but yes, definitely it is going to aid in that direction only. So it says that most of the vehicles they contain, definitely they contain toxic metals, which are lead, mercury, cadmium, hexavalent, chromium, which are detrimental to the environment. Obviously, if such toxic metals are there, such and uh, toxic gases are also released as a result of the accidents which are happening, it is detrimental to our environment and obviously to the human health. So fuels and fuel leak, the fluid leaks because of accidents and also when we talk about uh, the Scrappage policy. So in the year 2021, India came up with a new national automobile scrappage policy, but it is still in the nascent stages, not so developed, not being implemented. And also because we don't have a structured uh, the scrappage policy, because of that, we end up piling up huge amount of automobile wreckage. And India has an estimated an estimated amount of 22.5 million end of life vehicles by the year 2025. So what are we going to do with them when we don't have a scrappage policy as of now? And hope so that we have a robust policy by the year 2025. So as to deal with such a huge amount of vehicles coming up and in the absence, with the absence of the widespread systematic facilities dedicated to proper recycling, the vehicles which meet with accidents or which get completely destroyed, they are left to rot by the wayside. So that's how things are currently. And obviously leakage of hazardous constituents such as oil, coolants, and glass wool. So you can find out more about what is glass wool. Then this can come in PT also. So since this, uh, this topic, this uh, issue is a new, so anything can come related to this. So you can find out more about what is glass wool. Then talking about the speeding limit. So this is uh, very nice. And again, I always focus upon coming up with smaller and simple ideas which can have a massive impact. So again, this one fits into that. So it is talking about if we... If we are able to, uh, you know, limit the reduction in the speed limit, basically we are able to reduce the maximum speed limits which are currently there. That is going to have a huge impact when it comes to you know, ensuring a sustainable environment. So let's see how basically the data is also given, the case studies are also given. So we'll be having a look at that. So it says that one of the biggest factors for the road crashes is speeding. So that the, the speeding itself is one of the biggest factors. So definitely we should focus upon this. So the share stands at almost 70% for all the road crash deaths is the because of high speed. So a simulation exercises conducted in other countries, but obviously that is applicable to each and every country because it is talking about the speed limit. So the assimilation exercise in Europe, it demonstrated that cutting the motorway speed limits, even by 10 km per hour, it can deliver 12% to 18% fuel savings for the current technology passenger vehicles, the uh, passenger vehicles that are functioning right now, that are which are running on the roads. So even a 10, 10 km per hour of reduction is is you can see that it can contribute up to 12% to 18% of uh, saving of the fuel. And obviously it would also help in reduction in the pollutant emissions. Then there is uh, an organization uh, which is uh, focusing upon the policy of zero fatality corridor solution. So the organization, the foundation is Save Life Foundation. And it has 
like in short the implementation of the solution also uh, when we talk about the mumbai pune expressway in 2016 uh, and what are the components of this solution so zero fatality corridor ensuring that no accidents there are no deaths uh, on a particular stretch of corridor so with the implementation of this policy it was witnessed that it helped in bringing down the road crash fatalities by 52% as of 2020 when we are talking about the mumbai pune expressways then initiatives under it includes guarding the natural hard structures such as trees using the crash barriers to prevent direct collisions with trees and another uh, component of it includes installing the retro reflective signage on the trees to make them more visible to the commuter commuter so that they are you know able to clearly see them and uh, uh, they also keep themselves safer then then it includes that government of india it is also building green corridors to go with the forest okay so this is also one of the things that can be mentioned that is a building of the green corridors so uh, these corridors they are constructed in such a manner that the wildlife and the biodiversity uh, in a forest area around a road or a highway they can pass through over that we can say it is kind of an foot over bridge for the wildlife to cross over given the traffic is not disturbed so that is one of the solutions and also we have missing and inadequate signages that is the second factor or the second cause behind the road crashes in india so the first one was over speeding second one goes to the inadequate signages that are installed and even in case of signages also we we need to ensure or basically this save life foundation it came up with the idea that uh, the material which is used when we install such signage boards currently we use asbestos so that is harmful to the environment uh, and instead of using asbestos we should be relying on aluminum composite panels however they are expensive but uh, the they ensure that uh, the harmful gases are not released and they are safe for the environment so also they are recyclable so these are uh, certain dimensions and ideas when we talk about firstly uh, you get uh, two things from this article you get a separate data set and the reasons behind uh, the deaths because of road accidents when we are talking about road safety and uh, this also connects to the topic of uh, ensuring and maintaining sustainable environment so for me it's it's a beautiful article please go through it once again on your own so next we'll be taking up already like we discussed it yesterday and day before yesterday also when we we're talking about the electoral reforms so this article is talking about should we have a separate panel or the same panel or the same manner for appointing the election commissioners as we have for the chief election commissioner so why are election commissioners distinguished when it comes to their appointment or to removing them so having should we have a collegium like panel or not so this a discussion involves the views of sy kureshi so who's served as a former chief election commissioner of india and jagdeep as choker so so let's go through what are their ideas about this topic so they said that according to them there definitely should be a collegium system and the current system where the government of the day it appoints the election commissioners on its own so there is we can say opaqueness no transparency with nobody knowing how it is being done so we we as citizens we do not know how and what is the basis on which the election commissioners are getting appointed by the government and we definitely need to bring in transparency so as to also ensure independent functioning of the election commission of india and ensure free and fair elections which is one of the basic structures of our constitution so when we say that should judiciary take up this issue or not so firstly judiciary has not taken up this issue so moto there have been petitions which are filed in the supreme court around this issue so the judiciary's power to look to look into this issue goes because uh, the judiciary is the guardian of the constitution and a free and fair election as is said that it is a part of the basic structure of the constitution and it has not taken the case so moto so pils have been filed and also the supreme court has to say that article 324 it says that the parliament need to come up with a law it need to pass a law or an act 
obviously when you pass a law it becomes an act so uh, which should deal about the procedure of appointment of the chief election commissioner and the election commissioners however despite 75 72 years of independence the the parliament has not come up with such a law such an act so that is the concern of the supreme court because obviously the need of the r is transparency when it is when it, we are talking about the appointment of the removal of the election commissioners so we live in a democracy and we demand transparency and accountability on the part of the government on the part of the executive so moving ahead so basically the government why the government is shying away or why the government does not want to you know come up with such a law such an act which is going to make things clear make things transparent is that right now since government enjoys complete power absolute power absolute control over the appointments so it why would somebody want to give up their power and control so that's why government does not want to give up the control on the constitutional body that is called the election commission of india when people are favoring the government basically the election commission of india somehow indirectly it favors the government and does not take up the issues as per uh, whatever like happens during the violation of the model code of conduct also and the such things keep coming up in news but as we say that the government does not want to give up its power and its control now talking about certain facts which becomes important for pt so the election commissioner the chief election commissioner is appointed for a term of 6 years or before the age of 65 years so whichever is earlier that is one condition that is one thing then also constitution does not mention anywhere or any law does not mention that you cannot appoint a person who is 58 or 59 so the issue is uh, the thing uh, behind saying this is that since the government is you know appointing certain certain people or the person or personality as a chief election commissioners who are, who cannot fulfill a six year term and they are you know merely there for a few days so that's why the constitution or any law is not mentioning that you cannot appoint a person who is 58 or 59 or you can say who is very close to 65 years of age so that is one thing and so it is basically a convention a tradition which has been built over several years and which is followed so that's why we say that uh, you know um, that obviously the things then they are happening in similar manner over the years and talking about other developments we see that obviously so okay so it says that uh, Uh, any lawyer or a judge can also be appointed as a, an election commissioner so this is we can say what are the eligibility conditions you can find out more about it and google so uh, other thing includes that uh the current tradition is that the current convention is that an election commissioner is appointed and he is posted and elevated as the chief election commissioner so that th this is again it is a created situation and it is not that you know a chief election commissioner is directly appointed so a person who is who's been functioning is an election commissioner is promoted as a chief election commissioner and as we all know that election commission of india is a three member body with one chief election commissioner and two election commissioners and one is first among the equals so we need an independent institution promoting transparency and fair free and fair elections so we need to ensure that be it the appointment or the removal the procedure the process needs to remain same for both the cec and the ecs so this was the article which it was trying to convey talking about certain other indicators which we can say they are not we can say primary indicators but obviously we consider uh, the performance in that area also to so as to assess the performance of the economy so one of them is the electricity consumption so we are seeing that the electricity consumption has been growing in india and this indicates obviously in expansion in the economic activities the industries there are the industries and factories they are 
functioning. Then also the GST collections has grown in the month of November too. So these, uh, you can say, uh, obviously these can be asked in interview also. So you should be knowing about such indicators also. Then talking about what are the personality rights, what are the publicity rights, and this news is, is there because of uh, an interim order passed by the High Court regarding uh, regarding the protection of uh, a Bollywood star's name, image, and voice. So what are personality rights? So personality rights, they refer to the right of a person, sorry, to protect his or her personality under the right to privacy or property. So I repeat it again, the personality rights are the right of a person to protect his or her personality under the right to privacy or a property. So are these personality rights different from the publicity rights? So personality rights will just uh, first go through what are the personality rights. So there are two types of personality rights. One is the right of publicity. So in other words, we can say that it is the right to keep one's image or likeness from being commercially exploited without permission. And the second one is about the right to privacy or the right to not have one's personality represented publicly again without permission. So under the common law jurisdiction, the publicity rights, they so here we'll be looking at what the publicity rights and how are they different. So publicity rights, they fall into the realm of the tort of passing off. And they are governed by the laws like the Trademarks Act of 1999 and the Copyright Act of 1957. And here we are talking about protecting the personality rights, the publicity rights. So what about the consumer rights? So as far as the consumers are concerned, their interests are concerned. So con obviously consumers, they can be misled owing to the false advertisements or the endorsements which are endorsed by such celebrities and personalities. So the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, it came up with a notification in the year 2022 to keep a check on misleading advertisements and imposing a penalty on the endorsers if they were found violating or misleading the consumers. So this is the development and these are the consumer rights which are available to all of us as consumers. Then moving ahead, let's see, do we have anything more to discuss or not? Okay, so talking about the GM mustard, we talked about this yesterday. So you can see that topics, they are getting repeated. There is a chain of things which are happening every day, like we saw the developments about the Jalika two views of the government, views of the Supreme Court and the petitioners. So that's how we have this topic GM mustard in front of us. So what does the Supreme Court has to say about this? So Supreme Court says that is there really uh, any compelling reason behind providing environment clearance to GM mustard, especially when India has around 5,477 varieties of mustard. So why do we need GM mustard when we have so many varieties and species of mustard. So are we, you know, like, are we really going to face any food shortage because of this? Or you know, obviously we like generate oil from a mustard. So is there going to be any shortage or any food security problem? So Supreme Court is asking what has been or what is the compelling reason behind this? Because according to even the Supreme Court's technical expert committee, it does not favor with the GM mustard cultivation. And again, it says that uh, will the Indian agriculture be doomed if we do not have the GM mustard uh, present with our farmers for the cultivation? Is it really going to be that situation if like GM mustard is not available to us? So it says that uh, the review of the GM mustard, the GM crop, so this is what the Supreme Court had to say. Now we'll be looking at what the government's take is on this. So government says that uh, they had undertaken complete proper regulatory procedure and only after that they have given their approval, basically the genetically engineered, the sorry, the genetic engineering appraisal committee has given its approval to the GM mustard crop variety. So that is the argument and you should be knowing about these and you should also be knowing about that 
your views and your ideas falls on which side of it however obviously in mains you need to provide a balanced view with all the ideas all the pros and cons of any particular topic or a debate then we'll be talking about see, see we talked about the mixed economies signals the mixed economic signals that we are getting so again now this is uh, like showing us posing a very positive picture of the indian economy so it is showing that the manufacturing pmi that is the purchasers manager index it signals output orders at three months high and when we talked about the core sector we saw that manufacturing and the mining sector were the worst performing sectors and here we are seeing that now the orders are at three months high in the manufacturing sector and this is because of two reasons that is easing input cost so because of the supply chain disruptions the input cost they had increased so that was because of the supply side issues and second is because of resilient demand which has lifted the producers confidence in the economy so that's why we are seeing that orders are at 3 months high and you can find out more about the pmi what are what is the weightage and likewise so talking about now the india's jobless rate so this rises to 3 months high so we are not getting a very very clear picture about what is the future going to be are we heading into a recession a global slowdown given the global slowdown so this is the thing right now we just can have a look at how the indicators are moving and you know predict what is going to be the future economic growth for india so this data has been provided by the center for monitoring and economy which provides data for both rural and urban areas so this is it from the hindu now let's quickly take up the financial express so in financial express however we do not have much to discuss today but we have okay so this scheme which is talking about the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana so it has been revamped revamped and uh, will going to be get implemented from the current season 2023 so the scheme it is basically talking about including including the use of new technology that is artificial intelligence in assessing the crop yield data and so that the the farmers claims they are settled on timely basis and it is also talking about introducing the competitive bidding practices because this thing is not there and obviously it leads to increase in a, or or we can say a higher premium amount is charged on the farmers and also uh, other technologies which it is talking about incorporating in the scheme includes the weather information system and then we have the network data systems for assessing the wind speed and all of that then we have the yield estimation systems based on the technology then collection of real time observations which is the yes technology and the photographs of crops which is cropic for reducing the delays in the claim settlement so we are basically expanding the different technologies that we have so as to you know periodically disperse the claims Settlements of the insurers, and also there was a major change in this policy in the year two thousand twenty when the scheme was made optional for the farmers, and before that, uh, any farmer who wanted to avail a loan, who he or she had to compulsorily take this crop insurance scheme. Then we talk about that faster expansion in the production activities. Uh, it is talking about again the same news of PMI. So it says that because of certain slow down in inflation the manufacturing uh, sector is showing up uh, increased growth so we can say there is indirect relationship between inflation and the manufacturing sector's performance and also we talked about uh, clean coal so uh, here we can say our coal minister is talking about that india's requirement for coal is increasing so instead of you know focusing about reducing the usage of coal directly because we do not have any alternative or any substitute to replace coal as of now so we should focus more upon cleaner coal and uh, as far as uh, the india's coal reserves is concerned we have sufficient amount of coal reserves but the problem lies in lack of modern technology because of which the mining cost the input cost is higher and that's why we are importing coal which is definitely costlier to us and impacting our 
the BOP account. So we had a discussion, a detailed discussion about the clean coal and that is about the coal sector. So you need to keep revising these topics also. And we are putting up the PDFs, we are putting up the timestamps. So you can definitely go through them and they are going to help you in the revision also. So seeing a, a small development again, we'll be looking at that India's credit card base it grows, but the penetration still remains low. So when we compare it with other countries, uh, you see that the global penetration of the credit cards that is for 100 people. So it is just four people are having credit cards in India per 100 people. And this is, it stands at 340 for US, 132 for Brazil. So India is at the lowest level. So we can ensure a higher amount of credit card penetration. So you need to think what can be that other ways which you will be taking up for ensuring the expansion and the penetration of credit cards. So this is it for today. I hope you enjoyed the session and you understood it as well. And thank you for joining and Sarkari. Meet you tomorrow, but do not forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the like button and share the video as much as possible. Thank you, thank you so much. And see you tomorrow.